it's re- it's interesting. The Torah tells us in Pasuk Gimel, Vayogur Moav Menei Om Meod. And Moav was frightened or terrified. In modern Hebrew, I'm not sure how to say paralyzed. When a person is paralyzed, means that your whole function ceases to, to function. It's like you're frozen do overwhel- do the overwhelming level of fear. We find the Torah tells us regarding a dayon, a judge, it says, Lo sogurum neish. You should not be, you should not retract because of any man. I mean, a judge is not permitted to be intimidated by any of the defendants unless it's a question of life and death. But because of a person's financial status or distinction, he should not be intimidated by that. Lo seguru, he should not be withdrawn. He should not retract. The word lo seguru means you should not retract because of anyone for whatever reason may be. Vayogra means pachad is fear. Yira is fear. Vayagur means the fear is so overwhelming that you're retracting, meaning you cannot function. You cannot function properly because of the level of fear that you're overtaken with. That's the word Vayogur. The Balaturim cites the Posuk in Oz Yoshir. When Klal Yisrael said Oz Yoshir after the sea split and closed on the Egyptian armies, it says, Ele Moav Yozoma Rod. The powerful ones of Moad, they were taken by Rod, by trembling. They were trembling. So, and this is alluding to this Vayogar Moav. This Vayogar Moav began already with the closing of the sea on the Egyptian army. Now that the two protectors of Canaan, the two giants being killed, this is already brings it to another level. Rod means you tremble. Yogar means the trembling leaves reaches a level, a crescendo, that you become non-functional because of the overwhelming level of fear that it's literally terrified. It's interesting. Normally, when a person comes to certain situations in life, you come to a level of clarity. The person wasn't humble, and due to his lack of humility, he failed. So if the person is lucky, he will recognize that the what was the basis of his failing or his short-sightedness it was his arrogance. You think very often a person, when he's cornered, he becomes desperate. In a state of desperation, people don't think rationally. I mean, factually speaking, Moab, as the all the commentaries explain, as Jay alluded to this yesterday, Moab is a descendant of Lot. The Jews were not permitted to, to conquer the territory of Moab. So why is Moab getting involved here? They should stay out of the fray. The answer is, factually, the two giants, Ogim and Sihon, were the protectors of Canaan. The Jews destroyed and took away every level of security. When your security is taken away, you become frantic and you, a sense of desperation comes, overcomes you. When desperation overcomes you, one doesn't think rationally. We read in Pirkei Ovos, you should pray, you should pray for the welfare of a government. If not for fear of government, people will swallow one another alive. Literally, it will become a level of anarchy that people will swallow one of them. It's not first they will kill them, then, then, then eat them. They will swallow one another alive. So I asked, I mean, so the only reason why people behave and don't behave like predators is because they're afraid of, of the consequence of, of punishment, of incarceration, of, of penalty, or criminality. If there's fear of government, People are not desperate. People are tranquil. People think rationally. The moment there's no fear of government and it's survival of the fittest, if a human being goes into the survival of the fittest mode, 
It's a state of desperation. It's survival. When a person goes into survival mode, people don't think rationally. So the rational person becomes irrational. Once you become irrational, below each person will swallow one another alive. Of course, it's a question, is it's me or you. Over here, they, because they're so overwhelmed with fear, although Moab is not going to be destroyed by the Jews, because they can't, they're not able to take the territory. This is only the seven nations of Canaan. So if that's the case, I mean, what is Bullock getting involved in the fray over here? The answer is because going way back to Kriyas Yamsuf, as it says, Yozome, O Eli Moab, Yozome Rod, even the powerfuls of Moab, they were overtaken with fear when they realized if the Jews could destroy the Egyptian army, which were the most powerful army, and now they destroy the giants, now it's already come to its climax that there's nothing that could stop these Jews. So therefore, once you no longer have that sense of protection, you become irrational, you become desperate. And desperation, you get involved even where you shouldn't get involved. I pointed out, Bullock saw what the Jews had done to the Amori. The word is Israel. Israel always connotes the spiritual characteristic of the Jew. I mean, how do you destroy two giants? You need a certain spiritual standing to be able to destroy them. You cannot destroy them conventionally. You can't even destroy them through, through sorcery. Evidently, they have something, whatever that secret weapon is, they have a secret weapon, and through that secret weapon, they were able to destroy the protectors of Canaan. And that's Asher Osi Yisrael Amori, what Yisrael did to the Amori. But Vayogar Moav, Om Maud. But Moav were overwhelmed with fear because of the Om, Kirafu, because they were numerous, because of the numbers. So the way I understand it, Bullock wasn't an ordinary person. Bullock himself, as it's explained by the commentators, commentators and by the Midrash, was, was a sorcerer. And he saw, he had a very keen eye, and he understood the only way he could destroy these giants is only because of Yisrael. But what about the common folk? The common people, because it says when it says that Yogar Moav, Mibne Om, would speak between those are the people. The people don't understand. They say, but the Jews, as we're told, millions of people are coming. Kirafu. So they it's they don't appreciate Yisrael. They don't appreciate the spiritual characteristic of the Jew. Bullock appreciates that. But what do the common folk appreciate? We're outnumbered or the numbers which are formidable numbers, which you can't go against them. They became frustrated. They didn't know where to turn. Rabbi, so yesterday, Rabbi, yesterday yeah. Jay ended with a question. About how yeah. we were we were not allowed to conquer. Well, I mentioned that. I mentioned that yesterday. I I mentioned that. I mentioned it right before you came on. That's why. That's why the La Mori had to take Moab first, so we could. No, no, that's so that's the question. If we were able to take in last week's reading that 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 territory, because it already was taken by the Amori, that means we were not permitted to take Moab. We were not because they the descendants of Lot. So if that's the case, what's that? That was the question. Why is a bit ball of getting involved in the fray over here. He shouldn't get involved altogether. So the answer is I'm saying, because when a person is overwhelmed with fear and becomes terrified, you become irrational and you become desperate. And when a person becomes desperate, when your protector was taken from you, it's survival of the fittest. When survival of the fittest, you don't make calculation, well, they're not permitted to conquer us. You never know where the Jews are gonna go. That, that That's in a state of desperation. Therefore, Bullock was, got involved and he actually orchestrated whatever was going on over here. Bolok <clears throat> sent agents to Bilom 
than Baor Pesora. So Rashi himself explains what is the word what does the word Pesora mean? Kishukhani Azesh Koma reach no most can call him Lochem originally Grusayan. The word Pesora in Aramaic means a table. A banker or a money changer, he had a table, he had all kinds of currencies. All kinds of currencies came to his, his table, meaning all kinds of requests, because since Bilam was the prophet of the nations, and they knew whoever he curses will be cursed, whenever a king had some kind of issue, what did they do? They would send that request to Bilam, and he would tell them exactly how to deal with it. So it was sent to Bilam, Soro, because he's the man who receives all the requests from all the kings, exactly how to deal with all these issues. Eretz B'nei Amo, Shel Bolok, Moshe Misham Hoyo, he came from this location. V'zoyim Esnabi V'omer. What did Bilam say? And I mentioned this yesterday in the Medrash. Osir Atol Limluch. He told Bolok he's going to be a king. Well, if evidently he has that ability to prophesize that he's be a king, so therefore, and that's what I pointed out, the Medrash says that Bilam was an astrologer, and from the best. But whenever he would see in the stars what's going, going to happen in the future, he'd go to that person and says, I want to give you a blessing. But the, his blessing, as the Orchaim HaKodesh explains, was no better than Birchus Hamor. If a donkey gives you a blessing, it has no value. Bilam's blessing had no value. This was all deception. He convinced people that it was his blessing but had nothing to do with his blessing. So he had given a blessing, you will be the king. You'll be chosen to be the king. Therefore, as a result of that, since he saw Bilam has this ability, therefore, immediately when he has this issue, he sends messengers to Bilam to commission him to curse the Jews. That's the question. The Gemara points out that Bilam was a man who committed bestiality. He's a man, in Pirkei Ovis, we contrast Bilam to Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu was what was Daito Shvelo. He had a humble mind. Rucho Nemucho. He had a humble spirit. And Bilam was everything the antithesis of that. Rucho Gavoa, he was pompous. He was he was he suffered from megalomania. In addition, he was evil. He's the one who suggested the final solution for the Jews in Egypt, which was the bondage. And he himself committed bestiality. And now he's commissioned to curse the Jews. I mean, why would God want to have anything to do with this kind of person? One of the prerequisites to be a, a, a Navi, a prophet, you have to have humility. And this is the farthest thing from humility, besides being evil. So that's the question. So why did God to choose, why did God choose Bilam to be the prophet of the nations? that the nation world shouldn't have an excuse to say, if we would have prophets, we would have returned to a better path. So God says here, here's a Navi. They appeared to God They went, they breached the ultimate fence of the world. Initially, they were girded. They had certain stop gaps when it came to illicit relations, incest, adultery. And he told them the Jews of the, the God of the Jews cannot tolerate licentiousness, promiscuity. So the moment the Jews fail in that area, he will destroy them. It will activate the most intense level of the attribute of justice. So Bilam not only did not bring him to a better place, he brought him to a worse place. He breached the fences that the nations of the world created for themselves. Now, so the question, the obvious question is, Mark, this is a question you should ask, and everybody should ask this question. If he would have given them a prophet who was a prophet of quality, which had relevance to goodness, fine. He'd say, if you'd give us a prophet, we'd actually we would have returned to a better path. So God says, I'll give you a prophet. 
the prophet is the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because it says, Lo kum navi be Moshe. Among Jews, Moshe was the greatest prophet. But what's the inference? Among non-Jews, you could have a prophet as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm giving you that level of clarity. Let's see what you do with him. What he does with you. But he was an evil man. I mean, if he's an evil man and he could not tolerate Kedusha or holiness or godliness, I mean, what do you think he's taking these people? I mean, so how is this a response to the claim, if we would have had a prophet, he would have returned us and given some level of clarity to return to a good path, right? It's, it's, it's an obvious question. Alan, what do you say? Well, I think you mentioned in the past that, uh, that the leaders or the prophets of the people are determined by what the people are themselves. So that they deserved, <clears throat> they themselves were deficient in any kind of Kedusha, they were not descendants of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. They, they themselves were deficient, and therefore they were not worthy of having a, a good person like Moshe. They got what they deserved, and they had a free choice. They, they could still have improved and still made the right decisions. Yeah, but uh, wait, 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 wait a second. First of all, I, I, what you're saying, no, I did, never said regarding this. It's regarding something else. That's regarding leadership. You get a leader which which is parallels to who you are. What you deserve, that's what you get. Here, the point is, if we would have a prophet, he would give us a level of direction, we would return to a good path. But, but he gave him an evil man. So, so for instance, when Bilaam, when the, when the, at Sinai, when the Ten Commands were given, and, and they came to Bilaam, and Bilaam said, Hashem, always uh, yeah, yeah. Now, that, now you're saying something. That's what I said. What, now what you're saying now is what I said. And that's what they I said. said Hashem, yeah, and, they again, went back, and they went back to wait, what wait, they... Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Alan, he's, now it's something totally different. There's nothing you get what you deserve. There's nothing what you get what you deserve. A prophet knows things that, that the ordinary person doesn't know. He was a bad man. But as bad as he was, he had a reading which other people didn't have. At the time the Torah was given at Sinai, the Gemara tells us, the world quaked to a point, the nation's world believed the world was coming to an end. And all the nations came to Bilam and said, Bilam, what's happening? The world's coming to an end. He says, no, nah, it's not. Why? Because God made a covenant with existence that he will never destroy the world again after the great flood. So the nations of the world said, but that's by water, but maybe he's destroying the world by fire. So he says to them, you're a bunch of fools. Don't you realize Hashem Ozlam Oyite, that God is giving his power to the Jewish people and he responded, Hashem Yivorah Samova Shalom. That was the back and forth with Bilam and the nations of the world. What was Bilam's value? That was his value. He gave them, that was the eye opener for the good path. He showed you the right path. If God, if the world is quaking, because he's giving this Torah to the Jewish people, and he's, and he's valuing them because of that. So how do you now turn your backs and go back to your idolatrous ways and all your levels of perversions? How do you do this? He gave you, he gave you the, the secret. So he says, I gave you that prophet to give that moment of clarity to return to a good path, and you chose to go south rather than going north. Therefore, after that moment, as a prophet, you have no you have no claim any longer. If you would have given us a prophet, I gave you a prophet. He told you what it's all about. He gave you my address, where to go. So why don't you follow suit? The answer is you have no interest. God has only taken away every excuse. Of course, they failed with prophet without. But the question is, what do the people believe? The Mari tells us in Avodah Zorah, at the end of time, God will announce to the world, whoever has a share in Torah should come and take his rightful share. And all the nations line up and they all claim they have a rightful share. And God shows them they have no rightful share. That whatever they did, they did for themselves. It was not for the sake that the Jews should study Torah. So then they come back with a claim and says, and how do you know that the Jews study Torah and did the right thing? A father can't testify on behalf of his son. Creation have conflicts of interest, because if not for them, the world would come to an end. So of course, they're, they're going to testify in the positive that the Jews did what they were supposed to do. But then they, they came with a claim. 
You put a mountain over the heads of the Jews so they should accept the Torah. So when you offered us the Torah, we rejected it. Why don't you put a mountain over our heads? That's another claim. So God says, as they say, for God's sake, the seven Noahide laws, you don't observe. I should give you an additional obligation. Do you think you're going you're gonna to toe the line? You think you're going to observe it? I mean, the whole thing is, is absurd. But it says, nevertheless, God doesn't want anybody to have any excuses. Even though the whole thing is absurd and ludicrous, that you don't keep what you're supposed to keep, which is seven, you're going to keep 613. Nevertheless, they say, you did for the Jews what you didn't do for us. God said, no problem. I'm going to give you a last chance. I'm going to give you a simple mitzvah, which is not even costly. What's the mitzvah called? Sukkah. Go build sukkahs. Let's see how you fulfill that mitzvah. This hasn't even taken place yet. This is going to happen at the end of time. All the Gentiles are going to run with their building supplies. This is, you know, whether it's Lowe's or Home Depot, I'm not sure where they're going their building supplies. With the cost of building supplies, I'm not sure. It's not such a cheap mitzvah. But it says it's not a costly mitzvah. So evidently, the price of building supplies are coming down before Mashiach comes. You don't have to worry about it. They're going to be running to build the sukkah. And as they build the sukkah, they go into the sukkah. God takes the sun out of its sheath, and it's scorching hot. And the Gentiles, they run out of the sukkah. So God says, you see, you don't fulfill the mitzvahs of the Maris. What are you talking about? If you're in a state of distress or pain, you're not permitted to stay in the sukkah. So why is that a claim against them? So the Gemara says, because when they leave the sukkah, they just don't walk out. They kick the sukkah with disgust. And they said, what do we need this for? So he says, that is the moment of truth. If it doesn't go your way, you, you kick it. You reject it with, 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 with disdain. That's the difference between you and the Jews. You failed. That hasn't yet happened. But again, you had your chance. You had your chance at Sinai. I gave you the prophet. He gave you that clarity. So why don't you, why don't you take advantage? The answer is, that takes away your excuse. You have no excuse any longer. If we would have, we would have been better. Here, I give you the prophet. He gave you the, the roadmap. Why don't, you, why don't you follow it? You have no excuse any longer. But nevertheless, they say, but you know something? When we walked away, you should put a mountain over our heads. God says, you know something? You don't keep the seven. Do you think you're going to keep 613? Nevertheless, I don't want you to have a complaint or a claim. Uh, even that I'm going to take away from you. I give you this opportunity. At the end of the day, it's going to prove to be who you really are. Rabbi? Rabbi, maybe, maybe it's happening now, but the price of lumber is plummeting, just so that you know. That's right a good now. sign. Very good sign. From a very high base. Rabbi, um, wasn't Bill um, a descendant of Lavan? No, no. There's a question in the Midrash, who was Bilam? Was he Lavan? Was he, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean he was the same person. The Gemara only, the Midrash, it's a Midrash. The Midrash says, was he A, B, C, or D? You know, it's like the Maral says that, it says, Bein Hashmoshos of creation, right when, right before the seventh day, Bein Hashmoshos, there were 10 things created. Pio Oretz, the Pia also, we speak about the donkey, have the ability to speak. The ram that Avraham Avinu used for the Akeda. I mean, I mean the, from the time of creation till the Akeda, the ram was waiting around. Or that donkey existed, and all of a sudden this donkey all of a sudden starts talking. Morale says no. It means in, in creation, there is that existence that when the time comes, it will manifest itself that that ability will, will, will be a reality. The donkey will be able to talk. That special ram will be brought in the place of Yitzhak as, as the sacrifice. The earth will open its mouth. That will exist in existence. But if you try to locate it, you're not because it doesn't exist. It's only in the potential, in the reality to happen, it's already, the dynamic is set to happen whatever it's meant to happen. So when we speak about Bilam was A, B, C, or D, there were various representations of evil in the past. He is part of that representation, but it's not the same person. Lovan, we know, as we say, 
Lovin Bikin Shlekar Sakol. Lovin wanted to destroy Yaakov and his family. He wanted to uproot everything. Bilam was of that ilk. That level of, and to be the antithesis of Kedusha, to want to uproot it totally, that was Bilam. So it doesn't mean he was the same person. That's the morale of Prague. I, I said like a descendant, maybe. 